Uh, good evening. My name is Darius Schnika, and I'm a consultant plastic surgeon um, at the Royal Free. And I also uh, work privately at Hospital of St. John and St. Elizabeth. Um, I'm going to give a talk on common hand surgery conditions that you may uh, see in primary care. Uh, so the bulk of the talk will be about elective hand surgery and just briefly on uh, pediatric hand surgery and also my other area of interest, which is microsurgical reconstruction. So Dupuytren's disease is very common in the UK. Um, it's a fibroproliferative disease of the hand, um, and this can result in contracture of the digits, often the little and the ring finger, as demonstrated in the picture, and it affects the normal fascia of the hand. Um, so here you can see this gentleman has got a cord developing in his middle finger, and this is probably less than 30 degrees. Um, and there's a number of ways which we'll talk about that you can treat this. And obviously, if it's very mild disease and he may just have a few nodules in his palm, probably not necessary to refer him on. Um, and only if it's causing functional problems, um, uh, then think about a surgery. So one test that you can do is the tabletop test. Um, here you can see the Dupuytren's in the right hand, the patient is unable to place his hand flat on the table and it's affecting day, uh, their, their, their job, their activities of daily living. And I think a lot of the criteria in, um, in the NHS is if the MCP joint is uh, contracted more than 30 degrees, and if there's any PIP joint contracture, then that's um, uh, an indication to refer and also to uh, consider surgery. Other thing to look at is the diastesis, and this is when patients have bilateral disease. Um, they uh, the disease is early onset. It's radial sided, so it's affecting the thumb as well. You can see marked in that patient on the right. Um, family history more than two digits involved, and also ectopic disease and other sites, um, and in very severe cases or patients that have had it for some time, you may even get something like a pterygium here. And this, this patient went on and had an amputation. Um, so it's probably good to try to refer um, when something can be done. Um, so not to leave it for too long. So surgical options, needle fasciotomy, and that essentially means getting a needle under local anesthetic and breaking up that cord. The surgical options um, in main theatres, so fasciectomy, that's removing the disease um, under regional anaesthetic. Um, and uh, for recurrent cases, people still do dermofasciectomy, and that means removing the disease and putting a skin graft in as a fire break. Um, but there is some evidence emerging that this is, that's higher risk surgery, also is a higher risk of complications. And there's also risk of, of it not going entirely to plan and having an amputation. A lot of people used to use Zyapex, and this is um, uh, a collagenase, essentially, that breaks down the cord. We used to give it an injection, wait a week, and then the cord would just snap. But we found that there's no difference between this and needle fasciotomy. And this is very expensive, so it's now off license in the UK. So this patient, the elderly patient who had MCP joint contracture, a prominent MCP joint cord, so offered a needle fasciotomy. And we're just going to the next slide. Um, so we have published on this and you can use it for recurrent disease, but you've got to accept the higher recurrence rate. Some patients prefer this because it's, it's, you can do it under local anesthetic and go home very easily within the next hour that the procedure is done. Um, my colleague Norbert, who taught me this uh, technique, um, he suggests that patients should have lifelong splinting as well um, to reduce the recurrence. So this is that same patient. I've just released the, the cord and you can see this is the long-term follow-up at about six months. This is just a video demonstrating that technique. The MCP during the cord and just with tripod grip, 
You can see we've just broken yeah, it up. Yeah, it was really stuck, wasn't it? And then you just feel it literally just snapping. This is fasciectomy. This is where the patient is, un, is un, either asleep or under regional. You can see the patient's got a, a PIP joint contracture. You can still use the needle fasciotomy technique to do the release. Um, but generally, it probably safer, works better at the MCP joint. Um, and here you can see that disease, that fibroproliferative disease that we're peeling off the nerve and the artery. And there you can just see cutting it away from the vessels. And then we do little zigzags called Z-plasties because to prevent um, contracture. And this is the result. But you don't get here without obviously patient compliance and also hand therapy. It's very important to have good hand therapy on site. This is the other technique that I mentioned, dermofasciectomy, which I rarely do um, for recurrent disease it is associated with quite significantly higher morbidity. So um, Dupuytren's, um, that's just kind of like a whistle-stop tour of it. Um, and um, I would, you know, don't delay your referral, um, particularly if um, the patient has got a significant contraction more than 30 degrees. Trigger digit, something a little bit more straightforward. Um, you'll see this in both adults and in children. Um, and often presents with pain over the A1 pulley. The A1 pulley is just over the MCP joint heads. Um, and patients will complain of clicking and pain. And sometimes they, they, they find that the digit gets stuck. Um, and sometimes that needs more than just a simple release. Majority respond to steroids. Um, I saw a patient recently, I did a steroid injection and it lasted for about nine months. Um, and um, it can have an association with um, diabetes as well, if, particularly if multiple digits are triggering. Um, in children, it usually resolves. Um, if it doesn't, by the age of two, then um, consider surgical release. And in children, if it's particularly affecting the thumb, you'll feel a little nodule around the base of the thumb. So when to refer, obviously unsure of the diagnosis. If you're uncomfortable with injecting technique, I usually use a bit of local and then add cortil. Um, and if it's stuck and it's very painful, just refer on. So you can see here, this oh, is a patient. I open it up. Okay. So this gentleman's got triggering on the right middle finger. So we're marking out the position of where we're going to make our transverse incision. The A1 pulley should be around here. And uh, we're doing this on the ligament pain adrenaline. So a lot of procedures in hand surgery can be done under local, um, local with adrenaline, the so-called wide awake, local anesthetic, no tourniquet technique or Wallant. Um, and a lot of things can also be done under regional where you block the entire arm. And interestingly, after COVID-19, uh, particularly at the Royal Free where I work, um, we changed up everything to pretty much under local anesthetic or regional. Okay, and open it out, make a fist. You get an immediate result from that release. Dequavans is also something quite common, um, and you can do the Finkelstein test. It's um, tina synovitis in the first extensor compartment, so passively stretching, that causes exquisite pain, or actively stretching, Eikhoff's test. Um, and you can, you know, um, mistake it for a thumb-based osteoarthritis, so you can do a simple x-ray to check. Rest and analgesia with ibuprofen if it's not in contraindicated. And um, steroid injections, steroid injections work very well. You can um, get an MSK radiologist to do the steroid injection. Um, and surgery is a last resort. So um, this is a pathway that you can follow um, and you can refer at any of these points. So uh, the, the tendons in this compartment, the EPB and APL, and again, under local anesthetic, just releasing that, you can see the slips of the tendons. Often that APL tendon has multiple slips. Now, carpal tunnel is really uh, common. Um, often it, it causes intermittent paresthesia in the distribution of the median nerve, which is the thumb index and middle. Um, and 
often the cause is idiopathic. Um, it can sometimes be associated with underlying conditions um, such as problems with the thyroid or even pregnancy, you can get bilateral carpal tunnel. Um, and in your history, you want to see if it's affecting their, um, their routines, daily activities, are they unable to do things like opening jars, clothes themselves? Um, is the thumb affected? Um, is the little finger affected? Because it could be a cubital tunnel. Um, are the symptoms bilateral? And do they have neck symptoms? So you can have double crush phenomenon, and that's where the, the neck is involved as well as the carpal tunnel. On examination, the first thing that you do is look. And on the right, you can see here, this lady has some wasting of her right thena eminence. So that's where the APB muscle is. And uh, Tinel sign is where you percuss over the carpal tunnel, and they do get some paresthesia over the distribution of the median nerve. The Phelan test is where you, high, you flex the, the wrist and you ask the patient to, to um, uh, see if they notice anything. And if they notice some paresthesia de developing, that's suggestion of um, carpal tunnel symptoms. And sensation, there's sensory loss in severe carpal tunnel, motor function, if they've got weakness of abduction, um, and also the scratch collapse test, which um, you, can, you can look up. It's been described by Susan McKinnon, um, but um, um, I can't entirely explain it, but it does work. This is a video for it, but I, I suggest you have a look on, online for that one. So double crush phenomenon. So you can get carpal tunnel if, even if you've got neck symptoms. So when you've got, you think you have double crush phenomenon, I always order a nerve conduction study and particularly for bilateral carpal tunnel. But if there's a classical presentation of carpal tunnel, there's no need 100% to, to order a nerve conduction study, but it does, um, it is useful as a baseline and it's also very useful, um, I think, medical legally as well. Um, injections, particularly useful as a diagnostic test um, and also um, in, in pregnancy. I've had success in patients who've got carpal tunnel in pregnancy, but it often just delays surgical release. Um, some centers and um, healthcare authorities suggest that you do steroid injections, a set of two before the surgery. Um, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's different in every, every region, but um, if a patient's got moderate to severe carpal tunnel, I would, I would offer open release. Um, so if you've got classic unilateral carpal tunnel, night splints may help in mild cases, steroid injection. If that doesn't resolve it, open or endoscopic release. And when to refer, so moderate to severe, not resolved on splinting or steroid injection um, and positive nerve conduction studies. And the BSSH have got a nice kind of algorithm. And it's if you look on their website, they've got a lot of um, um, basic explanations for a lot of common hand procedures. Um, and uh, particularly for moderate, if they've got constant paresthesia, it's affecting their job um, and they've got weakness, then you've got to release it. Often when you release and it's, it's a severe carpal tunnel, they may not ever get complete resolution of the motor or sensory deficit. Um, so here, this is the open technique so that I use. here's the median nerve, and this is the palmar fat pad. And that means that we've completely released. So here you can see, this is the transverse carpal ligament and the nerve is underneath. Um, I do this case again with the patient awake under local anesthetic adrenaline. Some people use endoscopic technique. So this, my friend, uh, Phil, who does this in, in Ireland, he does uh, endoscopic advantages, probably quicker return to work, but there's a higher risk of nerve injury, particularly if you've got ab aberrant anatomy. And I will show you the video just out of interest, if you can see it. I don't think it's working, but um, essentially you've got the endoscope here, and this is the transverse carpal ligament, and we're just releasing it underneath here. Okay. So thumb base osteoarthritis, also something quite commonly seen in primary care. 
um, patients who've got is um, uh, a narrowing of the joint space, some osteophytes, a pain at the first CMC joint. Usually postmenopausal women is causing problems with grip and pinch um, and even difficulty using the mobile phone. So looking at the joints, obviously the, the hand is sometimes square um, and they may have osteoarthritis in other joints. The, the joint may have some crepitus to it. and It may also have some laxity and grinding on movement. Stage one, you may actually see a, a widened joint. That's pretty rare, but often you see a narrowed joint. Stage two and three and four is where you get tra pan trapezial arthritis and affecting, us, uh, affecting um, uh, the position of the CMC joint. There's uh, some subluxation there as well. So surgical intervention, steroid injection, I usually do it under x-ray guidance. You can send it to MSK radiologist as well. Splinting may help and rest and analgesia as well. So you can see here doing a steroid injection, I've increased the space in that joint. Um, and surgery, so in some patients, particularly younger patients, you've got to think of um, denervation. I, I think this is something that we're, I think the hand surgery community is doing more often. Um, joint replacement, particularly in the younger patient, I don't have any experience of this, but it's done more routinely in centers in Europe. Um, and I know a lot of orthopedic surgeons, orthopedic hand surgeons are doing this more often, but the long-term results um, obviously are, uh, need to be looked at and addressed. Um, still the gold standard at many of the meetings that I go to is trapeziectomy, and that means removing uh, that bone. Um, and you, there's various modifications of this, but trapeziectomy is still the gold standard. Other things that commonly seen bread and butter in uh, elective hand surgery is ganglions. And these can occur on the wrist, uh, the digits, so um, mucous cysts, um, and also, also flexor sheath ganglions. Often they don't cause any problems, but if they're painful, they increase in size, or the patient finds them unsightly, um, they can be aspirated, but there's a high chance of recurrence. Um, surgical removal can be performed, particularly for the volar ones, um, I usually uh, do these with uh, the patient under regional anesthetic because you can see here it's intimately connected and attached to the radial artery. And this is a dorsal ganglion. You can see it's stalked going all the way down to the scaphalunate joint. And this is a flexor sheath ganglion here, which we're removing under local anesthetic. So you can see here we've dissected the radial artery away from the ganglion and this is it out. You'll also see them on uh, around the DIP joints, particularly the thumb, index finger, and can cause deformities to the nail complex. And what I do is often get an X-ray and you can see some osteophytes and these are often associated with osteoarthritis of the joint. Uh, luckily, nowadays we rarely see X-rays like this uh, patients with severe rheumatoid arthritis um, haven't had any treatment for, for rheuma, rheumatoid. Um, and I think in terms of rheumatoid surgery, I think I've done about two or three cases in the last three years. We're getting much less in terms of the, the referrals um, because the treatment, the medical treatment is so good. So these patients often have a very low demand hand um, and they're good candidates for for joint replacement, uh, something called a Swanson joint replacement, which is almost like a spacer that you put inside the joint. And you can use these in the PIP joints and the MCP joints. In more high demand hands, you can use a metallic um, joint replacement called a pyocarbon. Um, there is a higher revision rate in these. Um, so this is a case uh, of mine where patient quite severe rheumatoid still getting quite a lot of pain. You can see that they're still quite swollen around the MCP joints. So the primary goal of the MCP joint replacement is really pain relief. And also as a secondary, maybe to improve function and also the aesthetics of the hand. And that's what we've achieved here. 
This is the early follow-up and she was able to write again and use her hand. Um, it's usually a transverse incision and put all of these um, silastic spaces in. You'll also see some simple congenital hand differences in primary care. Um, and the ones that I see are mainly syndactyly, that's fused digits, uh, duplications, and also accessory digits. Accessory digits are ideally referred very early so that we can just treat them under local anesthetic um, and remove them. Uh, because if you leave them too long, you can get problems with them becoming congested or torted, which I've seen in accident emergency. Um, and syndactyly, the treatment is usually surgical release between 12 to 24 months. If it's involving the border digits, as in the, where the little finger is fused to the ring or the index to the middle, then you've got to do it sooner under the age of 12 months because um, the, the difference in size and length of the, of the digits can cause contracture. So it's best for those to be uh, released earlier. And you can see this is an early picture at three months. And there's where the skin graft is taken from the cubital fossa. And this is a duplication, so common duplication that we see. And those can also be removed um, surgically, usually between 12 to 24 months. The other few things that you may see is some tendon ruptures. So this patient had- you Bring the right thumb up again. Okay, can you do and can you do anything with this thumb at all? Okay, he couldn't do anything. So um, this interesting, this patient had an EPL rupture, and this was most likely due to an attritional rupture because he's had a, you can see he's got a distal radius fracture uh, some time ago, um, and this can be treated by a tendon transfer. So I often see these patients referred to me in my NHS practice. Um, to raise your thumb up, have a look at your thumb. So you can do those, those things under local anesthetic, the tendon transfers. And this is the other classical tendon rupture, um, which is the FPL rupture where you've got, um, you can't, he's can't move his left hand. And then we've, we've done a tendon graft there to reconstruct that joint. The other area of interest that I have is microsurgical reconstruction and uh, particularly in ex 